good afternoon or good evening, wherever you may be. <laughs> Tonight or today, I'm going to do ch the Chanki Sutta. Now this has a, a lead up about protocol on who should invite who and um, how to pay respect. So Thus, if I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was wandering in the Kosalan country with a large Sangha of monks, and eventually he arrived at the Kosalan Brahmin village named Opasada. There the Blessed One stayed in the God's Grove, the Salatri Grove, in the north of Opasada. Now on that occasion, the Brahmin Chanki was ruling over Opasada, a crown property abounding with living beings, rich in grassland, woodlands, waterways and grain, a royal endowment, a, a sacred grant given to him by King Pasanati of Kosala. The Brahmin householders of Opasada heard the recluse Gotama was residing in Opasada, in the, the grove at Opasada. When the Brahmin householders of Opasada set from the Opasada in groups and bands and headed north to the God's Grove, the Salatri Grove. Now on that occasion, the Brahmin Chunky had retired to his upper, upper story, story in the palace for his midday rest. Then he saw the Brahmin householders of Opasada setting out forth from Opasada in groups and bands and heading northwards to the God's Grove, the Salatry Grove. When he saw them, he asked the minister, good minister, why are the Brahmin householders of Opasada setting forth from Opasada in groups and bands and heading northward to God's Grove? Sir, there is the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakians, who went forth from the Sakian clan, who had been wandering in the Kosalan country. Then, good minister, go to the Brahmin householders of Opasada and tell them, Sirs, the Brahmin Chanki says this. Please wait, sirs. The Brahmin Chanki will <coughs> also go to see the recluse Gotama. Now, during the time of the Buddha, the Brahmins were basically the rulers. They're the ones that everybody had to pay respect to. And that's where this part take place. Yes, sir, the, the minister replied, he went to the Brahmin householders of Opasada and gave them the message. Now on that occasion, 500 Brahmins from various uh, states were, were staying at Opasada for some business or other. They heard the, the monk or the Brahmin Chanki, it is said, is going to the recluse Gotama. 
Then they went to the Brahmin Chanki and asked him, Sirs, is it true that you're going to go see the recluse Gotama? So it is, sirs, I'm going to see the recluse Gotama. Now this is where their objection, because they were Brahmins, uh, this is where it starts. It sounds kind of like political uh, disagreements. Do not go to see the recluse Gotama. It is not proper for Master Gotama, for you to go see the recluse Gotama. Rather, it is proper for the recluse Gotama to come see you. For you, sir, are well born on both sides, with pure maternal and paternal descent seven generations back. Unassailable and impeccable in respect to birth. Since that is so, Master, Ch Master Chonky, it is not proper for you to go see the recluse Gotama. Rather, it is proper for the recluse Gotama to come see you. You, sir, are rich with great wealth and possessions. You, sir, are master of the three Vedas with their vocabularies, literary, liturgy, phonology, and etymology, and the histories as the fifth, skill in philology and grammar. You are fully versed in natural philosophy and in the marks of a great man. You, sir, are handsome, comely, and graceful, possessing supreme beauty of complexion. With sublime beauty and sublime presence, remarkable to behold, you, sir, are virtuous, mature in virtue, possessing mature virtue, you, sir, are a good speaker with good delivery. You speak words that are courteous, distinct, flawless, and communicate the meaning. You, sir, teach the teachers of many, and you teach the recitation of the hymns to 300 Brahmin students. You, sir, are honored, respected, revered, venerated, and esteemed by King Kosan, Pasanari of Kosala. You, sir, are honored, respected, revered, venerated, esteemed by the Brahmin uh, Pokarasati. You, sir, rule over Opas Opasada a crown property abounding with living beings, a sacred grant given to you by King Pasanadi of Kosala. Since this is so, Master Chanki, it is not proper for you to see the recluse Gotama. Rather, it is proper for the recluse Gotama to come see you. When this was said, the Brahman Chaki told those Brahmins, Now, sirs, hear why it is proper for me to go see Master Gotama, and why it is not proper for Master Gotama to come see me. Sirs, the recluse Gotama is well born on both sides, both um, of, of pure maternal and paternal descent seven generations back, unassailable and impeccable in respect of birth. Since this is so, it is not proper for Master Gotama to come see me. Rather, it is proper for me to see Master Gotama. Sirs, the recluse Gotama went forth abounding abandoning much gold and bullion, stored away in vaults and depositories. 
Sirs, the recluse Gotama went forth from the home life into homelessness. While still young, black-haired youth, endowed with the blessings of youth in the prime of his life. Sirs, the recluse Gotama shaved off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and went forth from the home life into homelessness. Though his mother and father wished otherwise and wept with tearful faces. Sirs, the recluse Gotama is handsome, comely, graceful, possessing supreme beauty of complexion. With supreme beauty, sublime presence, remarkable to behold, Sirs, the recluse Gotama is virtuous with noble virtue, with wholesome virtue, possessing wholesome virtue. Sirs, the recluse Gotama is a good speaker with good delivery. He speaks words that are courteous, distinct, flawless, and communicate the meaning. Sir, the recluse Gotama is a teacher of teachers. Sir, the recluse Gotama is free from sensual lust and without personal vanity. Sir, the recluse Gotama holds the doctrine of moral efficacy of action, the doctor of moral efficacy of deeds. He does not seek any harm for the line in for the line of Brahmins. Now this is an important thing. He didn't try to convert anyone. He didn't try to talk people into following him. All he did was state the Dhamma and let people decide for themselves. That's why he wasn't uh, seeking any harm to anyone else. He just gave the Dhamma, and that's something to be remembered. Sirs, the recluse Gotama went forth from an aristocratic family, from one of the original noble families. The Supposedly, during the time of the Buddha, the, the most educated was the Brahmin class. He was born in the warrior class, and those were the two different highbrow families that uh, ruled. His father was a king of a very big area, and uh, King Pasanati was a king of an, an, a different area that was very big. But they were considered equally important. The warrior class were the ones that, de that protected the Brahmin class. So, sirs, the recluse Gotama went forth from a rich family from a family of great wealth and great possessions. Sirs, people come from remote kingdoms and remote districts to question the recluse Gotama. Sir, many thousands of deities have gone for refuge for life to the recluse Gotama. Sirs, a good report of the recluse Gotama has been spread to this effect that the Blessed One is accomplished, fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, awakened and blessed. Sirs, the recluse Gotama possesses 32 marks of a great man. Sir, King Bimbasara of Magadha and his wife and children have gone forth for refuge for life to the recluse Gotama. 
Sirs King Pasanadi of Kosala and his wife and children have gone forth for refuge for life to the Rikus Gotama. Sirs, the Brahmin Poko Rasati and his wife and children have gone forth for refuge for life to the Rikus Gotama. Sirs, the recluse Gotama has arrived at Opasara and is living in Opasara in the God's Grove, the Salatri Grove. To the north of Opasara. Now, any recluses or Brahmins that come to our town are our guests. And guests should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated by us. Since the recluse Gotama has arrived at Opasara, he is our guest. And as our guest should be honored, respected, revered, venerated by us. Since this is so, sirs, it is not proper for Master Gotama to come see me. Rather, it is proper for me to go see Master Gotama. Sirs, this much is the praise of Master Gotama that I have learned, but the praise of Master Gotama is not limited to that, for the praise of Master Gotama is immeasurable. Since Master Gotama possesses each one of these factors, it is not proper for him to come see me, rather it is proper for me to go see him. Therefore, sirs, let all of us go to see the recluse Gotama. Then a Brahmin Chanki, together with a large company of Brahmins, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side. Now on that occasion, the Blessed One was, was seated finishing some amiable talk with some very senior Brahmins. At the time, sitting in the assembly was a Brahmin student. He was young, shaven head, 16 years old. He was a master of the three Vedas, and that's quite uh, unusual to be a master of three Vedas so early in life. With their vocabularies, liturgy, phonology, etymology, and the histories as a fifth, skilled in philology and grammar, he is fully versed in the natural philosophy and in the marks of a great man. While the very senior monks were conversing with the Blessed One, he often broke in and interrupted their talk. Now, the way, and this is for Buddhist monks too, the junior monks no matter they have something important to say, are silent. The senior monks, when they get together, they discuss things. The junior monk just listens. And that's the way it was from the time of the Brahmins. To have a 16-year-old boy break in and say, no, it doesn't quite like that because this, the sutta, the the text says this or that, and he was correct. Uh, the senior monks knew him to be quite intelligent. So they allowed him to have conversation with them. Then the Blessed One rebuked the Brahmin student. Let not the venerable Brahmin student break in and interrupt the talk of the very senior Brahmins while they are conversing. Let the venerable student 
wait until the talk is finished. When this was said, the Brahmin Chanki said to the Blessed One, let not Master Gotama rebuke the Brahmin student. The Brahmin student of Kep, Kep Thinka is a clansman. He is very learned. He's, he has good delivery and he's wise. He's capable of taking part in this conversation with Master Gotama. Then the Blessed One thought, surely, since the Brahmins honor him thus, the Brahmin student must be accomplished in, in the scriptures of the three Vedas. Then the Brahmin student thought, when the Master Gotama catches my eye, I shall ask him a question. Then, knowing with his own mind, the thought of the Brahmin student. The Blessed One turned his eye towards him. Then the Brahmin student thought, the recluse Gotama has turned towards me. Suppose I ask him a question. <coughs> this sutta is going to give you a very systematic way of teaching and learning. I gave a talk to a lot of college professors, and as soon as I got with the, got the done with the talk, they asked me where they could get a copy of it so that they could start teaching in that way because they saw the practical application of uh, this method of teaching. And that's why I wanted to give it to you today, because it is very good. Then, the bless then he said to the Blessed One, Master Gotama, in regard to the ancient Brahminic hymns, that have come down through oral transmission and in the scriptural collections, the Brahmins have come to the definite conclusion, only this is true and anything else is wrong. That is really a heavy state, statement, but that is the belief of a lot of religions. Only this is true. Anything else? No. It's wrong. So the Buddha's answer to that is, how then, a student, among the Brahmins, is there even a single Brahmin who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true and anything else is wrong. And the student answered, no, Master Gotama. How then, student, among the Brahmins, is there even a single teacher or a single teacher's teacher back to the seventh generation of teachers who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true and anything else is wrong. No, Master Gotama. How then, student, the ancient Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns, the composers of the hymns, those ancient hymns that were formally chanted, uttered and compiled, the Brahmins nowadays still chant and repeat, repeating what was spoken and reciting what was recited. Did even these ancient Brahmin seers say thus, we know this, we see this, only this is true and anything else is wrong. No, Master Gotama. So, student, it seems that among the Brahmins, 
there is not even a single Brahman who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true and anything else is wrong. And among the Brahman, there is not even a single teacher or a single teacher's teacher. Back to the seventh generation of teachers who says this, I know this, I see this, only this is true and anything else is wrong. And the ancient Brahman seers, the creators of hymns, the composer of hymns, even these Brahman seers did not say thus, we know this, we see this, only this is true and anything else is wrong. Suppose there were a file <coughs> of blind men, each in touch with the next. The first does not see, the middle one does not see, the last one does not see. So too, Brahman, in regard to their statement, the, the Brahmins seem to be like a file of blind men. The first one does not see, the middle one does not see, and the last one does not see. What do you think, student? That being so, does not faith of the Brahmins turn into be groundless? This is working or, or teaching how to not blindly follow whatever is being said, even in the suttas, there can be mistakes. When you, uh, one of the reasons that this meditation that I'm teaching is becoming more and more popular is because people don't blindly believe anything. And I encourage them, don't believe a word that I say. Your job is to experience it for yourself to see whether it's true or not. So the word faith in uh, Pali is sadha. And it's always described as faith. I don't like that definition. I'd rather use the definition of confidence. Because when you go through this experience, you have confidence that it really does work and you start getting a little excited by it. So many people are doing so many kinds of meditation and they, they hit a wall. They just hit a place where they can't progress very much after that. I have friends that have been doing meditation for up to 50 years and they they're very devoted to their kind of meditation, but they really don't have much progress in the meditation and in the understanding of the Buddhist teaching. A lot of that is because they use commentaries and a commentary is one monk's opinion of what he thinks the Buddha was talking about. It can be correct, it could be not correct. Part of it could be right, part of it can be wrong. But when you have the direct experience, you don't have any, any doubt at all whether this is correct or not. So that's why I don't like the word faith, because other religions rely on blind faith. And you'll see the answer that the Buddha gives here. And you'll see that it has to do with direct experience. So, the Brahmins honor not only 
out of faith, Master Gautama. They honor it as oral tradition. Now, a lot of people have heard that uh, Buddhism is an oral tradition. And it's an oral tradition when you hear me reading out of the suttas and repeating things over and over again. If you have a book in front of you and you're following what I'm saying, that goes to one place in your brain. But when you just listen, that goes to another place. It goes to your long-term memory. And because I recite things over and over again, it gets lodged in that long-term memory so you can remember what the Buddha was talking about when I'm reading directly from the suttas. I have considered uh, reciting each one of these suttas so you can pick up uh, without the dot, dot, dot in the book. So you can pick it up as an oral tradition. But an awful lot of Westerners, they hear something two or three times and they go, I've already heard that. I don't need that anymore. It's because they're used to putting the information that they have in a different place in their brain. And as a result, it's it's like eating fast food. You get you get the food, it, it satisfies you for a little while, and then you get hungry again. So practicing oral tradition, even though it seems old fashioned is the best way to learn the suttas. Now there are some suttas that I highly recommend that you memorize. And uh, these are easy suttas that I recommend to memorize. The Chichaka Sutta, number 146, in the Majjhima Nikaya, is very easy to memorize. Um, I had a student that when she came to me, she said, I, I don't have good memory. I can hardly remember anything. So at the time I was, she was uh, driving me around the country, 17,000 miles or so to the West Coast and then up into Seattle and then back down. And I proved to her that she could remember. Now what I taught her first was the five aggregates. It's only five, it should be easy to memorize. So I had her repeat this over and over and over and over for at least three hours at a time. And then I had her memorize the Pali. By the time we got done with the trip, she had memorized the five aggregates, the five aggregates in Pali and the Eightfold Path. Now this is, she said she couldn't remember this kind of stuff. And I proved to her that she could. Then one time I was going from California back home to Missouri. And I had her reciting the Chachaka Sutta. She would do it two or three times in the morning and two or three times in the afternoon. 
In four days, she had it memorized without any mistakes. So if you really are interested in knowing some of those suttas and how helpful they can be, she would get into a discussion with somebody and they were describing what they thought the Buddha was talking about and then she would recite some of the information from the Chuchaka Sutta and say, this is what the Buddha said. And she had it with her. That's the whole advantage of doing that. And there was a time that I was in Japan with her in December, I think it was, and it was cold. And no, no getting around it. it, it the ice on, on the ground. And they wanted the monks to walk about a half a mile and then up about 300 steps. Now, the student, she was prone to have cramps. And in cold weather, she was always complaining about her legs cramping up. So while she was walking and going up the steps, she was, to herself, was reciting the Chachaka Sutta. And when she got to the top, she realized that she didn't have a cramp because she was focusing on the Buddha's words. So it's, it can be very helpful in a lot of different ways to memorize either the Chachaka Sutta or the Anathampandika Sutta. Both of those, very easy to memorize, won't take you very long. But it will help you with your sitting, the information that you have, and your understanding of this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. So you have a lot of different kinds of uh, traditions that are very helpful with your practice and in your daily life. So, student, First you took the stand on faith. Now you speak of oral tradition. There are five things, student, that may turn out in two different ways here and now. What five? Faith, approval, oral tradition, reason, cogitation, and reflective acceptance of a view. These five things may turn out in two different ways, here and now. Now, something may be fully accepted out of faith, yet it may be empty, hollow, and false. But something else may not be fully accepted out of faith, and yet it may be factual, true, and unmistaken. Again, something may be fully approved of or well cogitated or may be reflected upon, yet it may be empty, hollow, and false. But something else may not be well reflected upon, yet it may be factual, true, and unmistaken. Under these conditions, it is not proper for a wise man to preserve truth, to come to the definite conclusion, only this is true and anything else is wrong. But Master Gotama, in what way is there the preservation of truth? How do you, how does one preserve truth? Interesting question. 
we ask Master Gotama about the preservation of truth. If a person, person has faith student, he preserves truth when he says, my faith is thus, but does not yet come to the definite conclusion, only this is true and anything else is wrong. In this way, there is the preservation of truth. In this way, he preserves truth. In this way, we describe the preservation of truth. But as yet, there is no discovery of truth. Now we're getting into what you teach yourself when you're meditating. Remember that you are your own teacher. And it's important for you to realize that when you see something for yourself, you can't be talked out of it. Right? You saw it. You know that this is correct because the results are what is uh, spoken of by many other students. If a person approves of something, if he receives an oral tradition, if he reaches a conclusion based on reason cogitation, if he gains a reflective acceptance of the truth, he preserves truth when he says, my reflective acceptance of the truth is thus, but he does not yet come to the definite conclusion. Only this is true and anything else is wrong. In this way too, student, there is the preservation of truth. In this way, he preserves truth. In this way, he, he describes the preservation of truth. But as yet, there is no discovery of the truth. Now we're getting right down to it. The direct experience of your meditation. In that way, Master Gotama, there is the preservation of truth. In that way, one preserves truth. In that way, we recognize the preservation of truth. But in what way, Master Gotama, is there the discovery of truth? In what way does one discover truth? We ask Master Gotama about the discovery of truth. Here, student, a monk may be living in dependence on some village or town. Then a householder or a householder's son goes to him and investigates him in regard to three kinds of states. In regard to states based on greed, in regard in states based on hate, in regard to states based on delusion. Now, you've uh, maybe some of you have heard me give Dhamma talks about greed, lust, hate, delusion. What is that describing? I like it. I don't like it. I am that. That's another way uh, in, in Zen practice, they call it the three poisons. But actually, it's not three poisons. It's actually just one poison called craving. And this is the importance of using the six R's often. When you Recognize that your mind is distracted. You release the distraction. This is a hard one for a lot of people because they get so involved in their own opinions and ideas and concepts and they take it personally. But when you release 
one of those kinds of thoughts and relax the tightness caused by that thought. Now this happens every time you have a hindrance and where do hindrances come from? Hindrances arise because of breaking precepts. So the more you stop breaking precepts and you start developing your mor morality so that it's more clean, more pure, you won't have as many hindrances arise. You won't have as many difficulties arise while you're doing the meditation. You're not going to have, you're going to have some of the hindrances. They're still going to come up, but they're not going to be as big or as troublesome. Any time you have repeat thoughts, that you, in your mind, you repeat just like they were on a tape deck. There is attachment there. There is craving there. There is, I don't like this. I want it to be different than it is. I want this to stop. I, I, I. Where does I come from? It comes from breaking a precept and feeling guilty and having remorse of breaking that precept. That's where the false belief in a personal self actually starts. What is craving? Craving is the I like it, I don't like it mind. I like it, I don't like it. And that's where attachment comes from. So when you are talking about going and uh, they're talking here about investigating three kinds of states, it's actually investigating one kind of state that's broken up into three different different things, so it's easier to comprehend. So, after a person has gone to, to the monastery are, and asked, are there in this venerable one, the monk that's in the head of the monastery, any states based on greed, such that with his mind obsessed by those states, while not knowing, he might say, I know. Or while not seeing, he might say, I see. Or he might urge others to act in that way that would lead to their harm and suffering for a long time. Now, when you're looking for a teacher, this is something that you need to look at and make sure you just don't blindly follow because other people are following. As he investigates him, he comes to know there are no such states based on greed in this venerable one. The bodily behavior and the verbal behavior of this venerable one are not those of one affected by greed. And the Dhamma that this venerable one teaches is profound, hard to see and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle, to be experienced by the wise. This Dhamma cannot easily be taught by one affected by greed. And that basically goes through the same thing again. 
when he has investigated him and seen that he has purified his, his from states based on greed, he next investigates him in states regarding hate. Are there in this venerable one in these states based on hate such that his mind is obsessed by those states? He might urge others to act in that way that would lead to their harm and suffering for a long time. As he investigates him, he comes to know there's no such states based on hate in this venerable one. His bodily behavior and verbal behavior of this venerable one are not those of one affected by hate. And the Dhamma that this venerable one teaches is profound to be experienced by the wise. This Dhamma cannot be easily taught by one affected by hate. When he has investigated him and has seen that he is purified from these states based on hate, he next investigates him in regard to states based on delusion. Are there in this venerable one any states based on delusion such that with his mind obsessed by those states, he might urge others to act in a, in a way that would lead to their harm and suffering for a long time. It's interesting that I have quite a few students that really do not understand the idea of no self, anatta. They think there has to be an atta before there can be no atta. Well, there already is atta. Every time you have broken a precept, you have created this false idea of a personal self. Now, the relaxed step is the key to the six R's. When you relax, your mind is clear, your mind is bright. There are no thoughts arising in your mind. As a result, you can say that your mind is pure at that time. So the relaxed step and the smile step are extremely important. The more you smile with your meditation, the sharper your mindfulness becomes. The clearer your mindfulness becomes. I had a student in Australia that had been doing a, a, a kind of practice that pretty much follows the Visuddhi Maga which means it was a one-pointed kind of concentration. He would practiced it for seven years, and then he wrote to me and he said, I've been doing this practice for seven years, and I don't see any personality change. I still get as angry as I used to. I still have all kinds of emotional upsets. And it doesn't seem that the meditation actually works. It works while I'm sitting in the concentration. And I can get into a state of bliss and it's wonderful as long as I'm meditating. But when I get out of the meditation and start living my life, I still have the same amount of suffering that I had before I got into the meditation. Can you teach me a different way? Now, he was doing mindfulness of breathing. So I told him how to do the mindfulness of breathing with the six R's. 
but he kept for, forgetting to use the six R's because his concentration would get so deep, nothing else would arise. So there was a problem with that. So I told him how to do it, and after a week or so, he wasn't having any, any progress in his meditation, and he kept on saying, well, I, I don't see any progress, I'm gonna go back to the old way of doing it. And finally, I got tired of listening to him complain, so I said, okay, you're, I'm gonna give you a different meditation. You don't know what's gonna happen with this meditation, so it's gonna be completely new, and you start from the start. And I gave him loving kindness. And when he got into the loving kindness, he didn't really understand the six R's. He started saying, well, I, I get attacked by so many hindrances. I, my mind is, is all over the place. What am I supposed to do with that? I'm gonna go back to doing the meditation the way I know. I said, no, don't do that. So finally, I got tired of him complaining. So I said, I don't want you to meditate for one week. I don't want you to sit down quietly for one full week. What I want you to do is smile all day from the time that you wake up to the time you go to bed, I want you to smile. And when you can't smile, I want you to laugh. And I didn't hear from him for a week. So, finally he wrote to me and he said, I want to tell you my experience of not meditating, which he really was doing, he was meditating, but just smiling. He said, always before I started smiling, when I walked anywhere, I walked with my head down and I, I was in my own hell realm. And when I started smiling, my posture started changing when I was walking. And I started looking around and the most amazing thing happened. As I was smiling, walking around people, they started smiling back. And that never happened before. And he said, even when I didn't feel like smiling, I smiled. And I found great benefit in smiling. My mind got more uplifted, more happy. And I wrote back to him and I said, do you notice any difference in mindfulness? And he said, I've been practicing supposedly a mindfulness meditation for seven years and I didn't even know what mindfulness was. Now I see it is an observation power. So the smiling is real important to the practice. It helps your mind to be light. It helps your mind to be more alert. And you can start to see the mud as it starts to get caught in the mud of emotional stuff. And you can let go of it more quickly. The fastest way to let go of an attachment is to laugh. Now, you're not gonna run across meditation teachers that tell you to laugh. As a matter of fact, I have some meditation students that have practiced with me for a little while and then they go to somebody else and they start smiling and they, they have this little chuckle when they notice that their mind is going crazy. 
and they get kicked out of the retreat. We don't allow people to smile in this retreat. Uh, well, okay. Don't. I didn't for 20 years. I understand the, the consequences of this. But if that's what the way you want to practice, then you practice that way. When you smile and your mindfulness gets sharper, your observation power of watching how this process works, your mind naturally tends to have more equanimity in it. So you don't have this roller coaster ride of emotions. I like this, I hate that. I like this, I hate that. You do that all day. And then you're, you're so exhausted at the end of the day, I got to lay down and sleep. I mean, I had to work hard today. Well, as you start developing your mindfulness, you're still going to have some ups and downs, but they're not going to be as radical and you're not taking them as personally. That impersonal nature is anatta. Okay? So the importance of using the six R's can never be overstated. It's real important that you use the six R's even during your daily activities. So, as he investigates him, he comes to see there's no such state based on delusion in this venerable one. The bodily behavior and verbal behavior of this venerable one are not those of one affected by delusion. And the Dhamma that this Venerable One teaches is profound to be experienced by the wise. Again, we have that, that statement, to be experienced by the wise. Seeing how this process works, seeing how the links of dependent origination actually occur. This Dhamma cannot easily be taught by one affected by delusion. When he has investigated him and seen that he is purified from states based on delusion, then he, he places faith in him, confidence in the teacher. Filled with faith, he vis he visits him and pays respect to him. Having paid respect to him, he gives ear. When he gives ear, he hears the Dhamma. Having heard the Dhamma, he memorizes it and examines the meaning of the teaching as he mem has, has memorized. When he examines their meaning, he gains a reflective acceptance of the teaching. When he has gained a reflective acceptance of the teachings, enthusiasm springs up. You start seeing for yourself that this really works and it starts to be fun. It's not so hard anymore. The more you practice having an uplifted mind, the easier it is to understand what the meditation is all about. When enthusiasm is sprung up, he applies his mindfulness. Having applied his mindfulness, he scrutinizes 
looks closely at how this process works. Having scrutinized, he strives. Now, strives here means the six R's. Okay. And I'll, I'll show you that in just a minute. Or not. I'm going very long again. Yeah. Resolutely striving, he realizes with the body the ultimate truth and sees it by penetrating it with wisdom. In this way, student, there is the discovery of truth. In what way, Master Gotama, is there is the discovery of truth in that way one who dis discovers truth? In that way, we recognize the discovery of truth. In what way, Master Gotama, is there the final arrival of truth? In what way does one finally arrive at truth? We ask Master Gotama about the final arrival at truth. What do you suppose the final arrival of truth is? seeing for yourself that this works. I have so many students that come to me with this great smile and radiance on their face and they say, you know, this really works. And they're surprised because they've been practicing years, a different form of meditation. And I have a lot of students that their progress in the meditation, I only give 10 day retreats. I don't need you for any longer than that. You will understand more Buddhism than you ever dream possible in 10 days because of your direct experience and the interviews that I give and the reading of the suttas. And you are going to realize the truth. Now, not everybody experiences becoming a Sotapanna or a Saktagami or an Anagami quickly. Sometimes you have to come back for one or two visits. But as you follow the directions, that the Buddha gives in the suttas and you're sincere with doing it, you will be successful, I promise. You will be able to be in one of the jhanas fairly quickly. I have one student here today he just came three days ago and he became an advanced meditator in three days. That means he got to the fourth jhana. Not bad for three days of meditation. He followed the directions, very sincere. He was curious about how this process worked. And he's starting to have fun. He's starting to sit back and, and just smile because it is so easy. Well, I won't say it's easy. It's simple. Sometimes it's hard. But most of the time, especially as you start going deeper and deeper, it gets e easier and easier to understand how this process works. The final arrival at truth student lies in the repetition, development, and cultivation of those things that I just read above. In this way, there is the final arrival at truth. In this way, one finally arrives at truth. In this way,
way we describe the final arrival at truth. So I've been talking for an hour and 15 minutes and I get scolded for talking so long. But this is this last section. Maybe we can print up this section, uh, section 20. And put it on our, our website because that's, that's the way you learn and are able to teach the best. Okay? So, I'm not going to be able to finish the sutta. It basically just repeats itself again. <coughs> Do you have any questions? Hi, Bonte. Yes. Greetings from central Pennsylvania. Greetings. Is it cold there now? Uh, we're actually having a warm, humid day today. Oh, wonderful. Martin t-shirt weather. <laughs> Good for you. How about Missouri? Uh, it's about the same. It's about 80 degrees. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a couple questions. I actually wanted to share something with you first that okay. I didn't mention today, but I had asked you about um, maybe about a month ago about the uh, the release step. Um, and I, I realized that I um, was going on to the, the relaxed step without actually having released the thoughts. And I, it, it, I had this insight that that doesn't actually work. Like it doesn't work if you try to relax when your mind is still sort of. Right. Um, you have to use a whole formula. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I finally realized that. So I wanted to share that with you because that was. Uh, Excellent. Thing that happened. Good lesson. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So my first question is about the precepts. Um, I'm wondering if, if the precepts are like, is it something in, is there something inherent in the human nature and the human mind about the precepts? Like, is it like if you, if you grew up never hearing about the precepts and if you learned a different code of morality, we're actually, you know, lying is a good thing or killing is a good thing. I mean, is that kind of guilt still going to arise or is there something inherent in the precepts? Yes. The progress in meditation is very, very slow when you have broken precepts. And speech is the one that gets broken the most. Telling lies. Uh, using foul language trying to divide one group from another. And the king is gossip. And gossip is basically making up stories about somebody else and spreading that rumor. That happens so much these days, it's just remarkable. And it happens in Buddhist groups. One group will spread gossip about somebody else that's teaching the Buddha's teaching. But there's jealousy and all kinds of things that happen because of that. So you have to be particularly mindful of what you're going to say before you say it and mindful about what you're going to do before you do it. And when you keep the precepts over a period of time, it turns into a protection for you. And this protection stops other people from uh, causing problems for you. And it can be a protection from an accident, being in an accident. I've been in, in two cars that have crashed and not been hurt. So keeping the precepts is a very good thing for you to do. It 
it's learning how to break old habits of thinking and develop new uplifting thoughts. And the more you can do that, the more other people like you and they start trusting you. I met a lady at one time, she had such a sweet voice. And as I got to know her, she wouldn't even consider breaking a precept. And I, I went into her shop. She had a, a cassette duplication set up. So she, I had a lot of uh, cassettes that I was giving out of talks and that sort of thing. And when I, the first time I went in there, I felt like I could trust her no matter what. And as I spent more time hanging out with her, waiting for the things to get done, I really developed a true, honest, uplifted feeling thinking about her. So when you can keep your precepts without breaking them, people will naturally start trusting you and trusting your judgment. So you can be helpful and give away your wholesomeness. So other people will be inspired to do the same thing. Okay? Thank you, Vante. Okay. I have one more question. Okay. Um, so this, this idea of self, I think I'm still, and not self, I think I'm still sort of coming in with some, perhaps some, some not correct understanding. So, I mean, it, you know, if there, and I'm hoping you can kind of help clear this up for me a little bit. Um, if, so if there's no self, then what is it that's, that is remembering, that's accumulating karma and knowledge, that's uh, being reborn. I mean, what... If Past actions is causing that. That's why you're here, because of breaking precepts in past lifetimes. And how do you get off this wheel of sansara? By using the meditation the way the Buddha taught it. And that is practicing your generosity. Give your smile away. Help other people to smile. Practice your generosity in that way. Keeping your precepts without breaking them. When you do that, you're... <clears throat> your general mindfulness becomes much sharper. And you will be able to see what you're going to do before you do it. Now, you have a thought of telling a lie to someone. Your mind will say, watch this. Are you going to do this or not? And why would you tell somebody a lie? So you let it go. So it, it helps your general mindfulness with your daily activities. And as you start gaining a reputation of someone that's going to be honest, then other people will start coming to you with things that you can help them solve. Okay? Okay, Bonte. Thank you very much. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Bonte, uh, thank you for your talk. I have a quick question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the Sutta talked about investigating a teacher based on the three poisons. Right. How do we balance between investigating a teacher and not judging him or her? Because no one's perfect. And if we picked hard enough, I'm sure we could find something that the, the teacher is not doing right. So how do we balance investigating and, and not judging a teacher? <laughs> Trust your intuition. 
I've talked about intuition fairly often. Trust your intuition. If your intuition says follow him, then do that. But still make sure that he's not caught up in lust or hatred or delusion. They can still make mistakes and you can be forgiving of that as long as it's not a habitual tendency. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Bhante? Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi. I have today one question and one sharing. Okay. Uh, my question is... Uh, for uh, like, once you said that you train successful students uh, to enter into jhana and stay in the jhana for some time, right? A fixed amount of time. Right. Uh, can it possible that uh, a person can enter into neither perception nor perception and stay stay for some time? Is it possible? Yeah. I have one student that stays in it for seven hours a day. He meditates four hours in the morning. The whole time he is in neither perception nor non-perception. And he does that three hours in the evening. And the rest of the time, his mind is very, very strong in equanimity. Very strong balance of when he's doing his daily activities. The reason I asked this question was, the reason I asked this question was like, based on my experience, I feel like uh, from nothingness to neither perception nor perception, there is no control, right? Well, there's still attention. You still have attention, right? You're paying attention. Your mindfulness has to be observing how this works. And if there's any slight movement, you have to relax and come back. So there's still attention that's there. Okay. But there is a lot of relief in being able to sit in neither perception nor non-perception. And you're not making any bad merit. You're making only good merit while you're sitting in there. Okay? Okay. Uh, so it's a real important step. Okay, Bhante. Uh, I will um, I'll go to next one. I want to share one of my experience. Uh, okay. In these days, uh, I am able to read the suttas and understand very easily. Means feel like means I perfect. And I can say that this I just practice like uh, two, three to three months. I think. I have been practicing FIM for three okay. months. And the progress is... Look you are. Sorry? How lucky you are. Yes, I am feeling very lucky. And I am feeling that uh, in these three months, I progressed a lot. Means I am able to just open a random sutta and I, and I am able to read it and I can understand it. <laughs> Yeah. It's pretty awesome. It's, it's yes. Really, really nice. <laughs> You're right. It's, I, it's very much fun. Every now and then I, I give a sutta to David that he'd never read before and he gets real excited about that. It's fun. Yeah. And uh, I'm very thankful to you, Bhante, for uh, answering a lot of my questions. And well, it brings, it brings me happiness to be able to help you. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's what my reward is. I get <laughs> a lot of happiness. 
It's are you Bonte? It's going to be around Easter when it happens, so yes. I think it'll be okay by then. Yes, I hope so. I am doing well. Good. Are you doing you... well? Um, I'm doing all right. Okay. Yes. Can you smile for a full day? <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Bonte, it's Elizabeth. Hello. Yes. Hello. <laughs> um, you know, I've just joined your Zoom meetings, or your Zoom Suta classes, and they're just absolutely marvelous. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. And I, you've probably already shared this, and it's okay if it's not appropriate. I know it's not going to happen today, but... I was, um, if you've already done this with the group, then that's okay. But I thought about you so much in India and I thought about all the uh, experiences you must have had and the obstacles you've had to overcome. And, and, and I wondered if maybe sometime in the future would, you would share with us what, was, what that was like for you. And maybe it was a walk in the park, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> maybe it was. Yeah. I, you know, you're you know, it's, it's a real interest. It's an interesting thing that I do have very good food karma. So <laughs> I don't go hungry. And people found out that I was there. I, I was staying at a, a compound that had 150 apartments in it, but there was only 10 people in that compound. Oh, wow. And they found out that I was there, and all of a sudden, they're, they're bringing me food every day. <laughs> so it was pretty much a walk in the park. I mean, there's no difference between being uh, uh, quarantined that than it is doing a retreat. <laughs> so it, it was pretty easy. Okay. I only, in 150 days of being in quarantine, I only went outside two times. Wow. The rest of the time I was doing other things. Mm. <laughs> so it, it, it was not, not that big a deal to me. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm not surprised. <laughs> 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 Thank uh, you. Okay. Uh huh. Hi, Annie. Hit the unmute or hit the mute. Uh, Hi. Good to see you. Yes, it's been years. I know, but I think of you all the time. Oh. I'm okay. always grateful for my teachers. How. Are you and your husband getting along? Is everything very, good? very good? Very good. We we have a sweet bubble in this world. Perfect. I, I was a little bit concerned when I heard of some of his health problems. Yes, he really did have a close call in 2000. 2015 was a rough time, uh -huh. but he is um, very resilient and he's doing fantastic. Well, it makes me very happy to see you again. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> Igualmente. <laughs> uh, okay. Anybody else have a question? Yes, Bonte, I have a question, please. Okay. Um, I had hoped to be able to ask you in person this week, but my travel did not work out. Okay. But... I don't want to take up too much time at the end here, so I wanted to ask you if I might write you a letter with my question. Sure. 
Okay. Send it to David. David will give it to me. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bonte. Okay. Let's do some sharing sharing of merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.